1974 saw the Watergate scandal claim its biggest victim, as US President Richard Nixon was forced to resign. There was political turmoil in Britain as well. A miners' strike brought down the Conservative government and Harold Wilson was returned to power. Also in London, a great mystery began as Lord Lucan disappeared, having apparently murdered his children's nanny and attempted to bludgeon his wife to death. In another high-profile case, heiress Patty Hurst was kidnapped and reappeared during a bank raid, having apparently joined her captors and rejected her wealthy background. But the rich and famous are not just at risk from outsiders. The history of crime is full of stories of children who are over-eager to get hold of their inheritance. And here are two bizarre examples. The first of which begins in this house in the quiet Long Island town of Amityville, a house whose sinister reputation later made it the focus for several Hollywood films. In the early evening of Wednesday, the 13th of November, 1974, the Suffolk County Police Department received a call from a bar in Amityville reporting a multiple shooting. When the police reached the house, there was a group of young men outside among them, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo, Jr., the son of the owner who had raised the alarm. The bartender who had called the police described what had happened. He came, he opened the door, and he was screaming, come on, help me, somebody shot my mother and father. And everyone ran out of the bar, and that was it. They Did all took go? off. No, I had to stay, I was tending off. They all jumped in his car and took off. Calling for backup, the first patrolman on the scene then entered the house. Inside, they found carnage. Upstairs were the bodies of Ronald DeFeo Sr. and his wife Louise, shot dead in their beds. Their sons, seven-year-old John and 12-year-old Mark, had also been shot in their bedroom. And 13-year-old Allison in hers. In an attic room on the second floor, their other daughter, 18-year-old Dawn, had also been shot. The next morning, one of the detectives was non-committal as he faced a barrage of questions from reporters as to what had happened. Do you know yet what the caliber of the weapon was that killed the family? No, broad information. Can you describe how they were found? Not at this time. Are you still questioning Ronald DeFeo? No comment. Where is Mr. DeFeo? No comment. OK. Sorry. Frustrated reporters watched as the police searched the house and its grounds. When he was interviewed later in the day, Suffolk County's chief of police was also determined to keep an open mind. We have no suspect at this time. We have no indication of the motive at this time. What about Ronald uh, DeFeo, the son, the surviving son? Ronald is being safeguarded by the Suffolk, Suffolk County police at this time. Why safeguarded? Why? Because the six members of the family dead, and we don't know why, and he's the sole remaining member. Is he also a suspect? He's not a suspect at this time. But for want of any other leads, reporters continued to probe the background of the man who had discovered the killings, Ronald DeFeo, or Butch, as he was often nicknamed. What does he do? Yes, he works at the Buick Agency, and I think you have that address already. What? No, we don't. It emerged that this was a family business in Brooklyn. The Buick Agency is Michael Briganti, Carl Buick, Incorporated, 1814. It was owned by Butch's grandfather, and his father had been service manager. While being safeguarded at the police station, Butch DeFeo gave them an eight-page statement about his movements during the 48 hours before the murder. On the Monday, he had been off work ill. He had spent much of the day sleeping or watching the TV. 
Unable to sleep any more, he had got up early on the Wednesday morning and driven to the dealership in Brooklyn. But there was little going on there. So at midday, he had come back to Amityville. Finding that he had forgotten his house keys, and there seemed to be no one at home, he had spent much of the afternoon at the bar. He was by himself, and uh, he didn't talk to anybody really, you know, just hello, how are you, and that was it. He didn't seem anything was wrong with him, you know. And then a little while later, he came back again, and he had a soda, and he left. And about five minutes later, he came back in and screamed and hollering about that his parents were shot. And everyone ran out of the bar and went down to his house, and that's it. Butch had also told the police that his father had fallen out with a notorious mafia hitman over a botched job carried out by the dealership. And he suspected that the killings had been carried out in revenge. Reporters had watched guns being removed from the house. But the police chief refused to give any further information about the murder weapon. What kind of murder? What, what do you think the murder weapon is? What, it's a firearm. I'm not prepared to discuss it in any other detail. Pistol, uh... Finally, one of the reporters lost his patience. It seems that at this point you really don't know very much about this case. Well, we know a great deal. But nothing about who done it. We know we have six bodies, we know that. We know that they were all killed, and we know how they were killed. So when you say we don't know a great deal, we know all that there is to be known at this point. And we hope to have more. What the police chief was not revealing was that his men had already had their major breakthrough. The searches which were now being conducted were for a specific weapon, and they already knew who had owned and almost certainly used it. Forensic examination of the bullets had shown that they came from a .35 caliber Marlin rifle. No such weapon had been found in the house, but a detailed search during the night had revealed two boxes in Butch DeFeo's room. One for a .22 Marlin rifle and the other for a .35. Even as the police searches were being watched by the increasingly frustrated reporters, Butch DeFeo was being warned that he was the main suspect. During the course of the day, he gave several different versions of what had happened, always featuring a mafia hitman as the villain. Finally, in the late afternoon, he broke down and confessed, saying, once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. He was charged with the murders. Butch described how he had woken at 2 a.m., got his rifle and killed first his father and mother then his sister Alison, then brothers Mark and John, and finally Dawn, who had woken and called from the attic to ask if everything was all right. Butch had then left the house after collecting up the cartridges and wrapping the rifle and his blood-stained clothes in some pillowcases. He had set off for Brooklyn. On the way, he dumped the rifle off the dockside into Amityville Bay. The rifle case, cartridges, and ammunition boxes he concealed in a drain in Brooklyn, where they were found by police the next day. The police also mounted a search of the bay. Their divers soon located and recovered the rifle from the dock at the end of Ocean Avenue. On Friday, the 15th of November, Butch DeFeo was arraigned in the first district court of Suffolk County on a single holding charge of murdering his brother, Mark. The district attorney made it clear that this was purely a procedural device and that DeFeo would eventually be tried for all six murders. Well, we're not obliged to lay all of the charges that we can at this time. From a tactical point of view, uh, we lay as little as possible in the way of charges. Uh, the premise being that we like to disclose as little as possible. He knew that forensically the case against DeFeo looked overwhelming, and DeFeo's defense counsel indicated how he was likely to plead. Well, based upon my uh, conversations this morning with the defendant, uh, Ronald DeFeo, and uh, Based upon the nature of the charge, I uh, don't think he presently understands the uh, nature of the proceedings, and I don't think he can therefore properly assist in his defense. Butch DeFeo had been born on the 26th of September, 1951, in Brooklyn. 
The family had moved out to an affluent neighborhood on Long Island when Ronald DeFeo Sr. was offered a well-paid job with his father-in-law's dealership. He had bought a substantial home and his children had seemed to lack for nothing material. But Butch had proved a surly and spoiled boy who dropped out of high school with no qualifications. He had a reputation for violence and his contemporaries were wary of him. No, well, he was the kind of guy, if there was a fight, you know, like if someone's gonna fight him, he wouldn't back out, you know. He didn't, like, I'm not saying like he'd go out and start the fights, like, like he, he would just beat it. Like if there was a fight ever broke out, like he helped the guy out. Butch had drifted through a series of dead-end jobs, ending up as a dog's body at Briganti Carl, earning $80 a week. Nevertheless, he spent heavily on drugs, drink, and girls, relying on handouts from his father. At the time of the murder, Butch was being treated for drug addiction. He was also on bail for suspected theft. However, this aspect of his character was not apparent well, to everyone. She, um, I, I think she adored him as far as I'm concerned. You know, she always said, that's my son. You know, I cut pride and joy, something like that. The same neighbor also saw the best side of the DeFeo family. Well, I figure, I think they were just very sweet, very religious people, very family-minded people. That's about all I could say. Very good, very generous, this type. I mean, very close with their children. But as the family was buried, another side to their relationships had begun to emerge. The DeFeos were notorious for being aggressive with each other. The father was particularly violent and on occasions beat up his wife. There was speculation as to where DeFeo Sr. got all his money from. Butch had been taking at least $500 a week from him and was also believed to be robbing his father whenever possible. There were rumors of a connection with organized crime. At 13, Butch DeFeo had been taken to see a child psychiatrist when he attacked his grandfather. Only a year before the murders, he had pulled a gun and shot at his father. It would not be the first time that the son of a wealthy family had wanted to hurry up his inheritance, and it would not prove the last. Another particularly cunning killing was to take place in Florida, just over 10 years later. It happened outside this house in an affluent suburb of Naples on the 9th of July, 1985. A Chevrolet Suburban blew up in the drive as the key was turned in its ignition. There were two explosions and a fireball, which completely wrecked the car. Two of the people inside were killed instantly. They were wealthy heiress Margaret Benson, who had been sitting in the front passenger seat. And her 22-year-old playboy son, Scott, who owned the car and had been about to drive it away. Miraculously, Scott's older sister, Carol Lynn, survived. She had been sitting in the back of the car with the door still open, and she staggered out with hideous burns to her face and upper body. Stephen Benson, their 33-year-old brother, had been about to get into the car when he had gone back to fetch something he had forgotten. Stephen Benson had started running back into the house and said, call the ambulance. The family had been setting off to measure up a plot of land on which Margaret was planning to build a new house. Stephen had come over from his home in Fort Myers, about 20 miles away, particularly to go on the expedition. But his van had run low on gas, so the family had to take Scott's car. This had obviously been destroyed by a bomb, and when detectives arrived, they asked Stephen Benson who might have planted it. He reckoned that it had probably been intended for his brother Scott, who was the classic spoilt rich boy who mixed with some fairly undesirable characters and was often getting into debt and relying on his mother to bail him out. For Margaret Benson had inherited a $10 million fortune from her father, which he had built up in the tobacco business. 
But when Carol Lynn was fit to be questioned by the police, another side to the story started to emerge. Stephen himself had also got into frequent financial difficulties and had borrowed heavily from his mother to keep his various businesses going. Indeed, his mother's lawyer had been waiting at the house on the morning of the explosion. She had wanted him to confront Stephen with very clear evidence that he had been embezzling her money. As the victims were buried, gossip about Stephen Benson was beginning to be backed up with some fairly damning evidence. The police had found various pipes in the wreckage, which had obviously formed part of the bomb. Detectives were able to trace the store at which the pipes were bought. It was just round the corner from Stephen Benson's office. The receipt for the pipes had a very clear palm print on it, and the store assistant gave a description of the purchaser which tallied closely with Benson. Benson had been reluctant to give a palm print, but once the police had taken the unusual step of obtaining a search warrant to oblige him to do so, it matched the one on the store receipt perfectly. Benson was arrested in Fort Myers on the 22nd of August, 1985, and charged with the murder of his mother and brother and the attempted murder of his sister. His trial opened almost a year later, on the 14th of July, 1986. The prosecution was able to build up a picture of a man whose life had been dominated by his mother. She kept a tight hold on the family fortune. Stephen had never been able to break free from her, and even when he had set up his own business, he had had to rely on her for backing and been unable to make a success of it. His sister, heavily scarred, was able to give the court a harrowing account of the explosion and its aftermath. I, I guess that seeing Scott's body and seeing the, the flames, it, shot, it kind of woke me up and, and I realized that the car was on fire and I had to get out. More significantly, she described how Stephen had insisted that his brother's car must be used and how he had forced his mother to get into the front passenger seat even though she preferred the back. But the most damning evidence was the palm print, backed up by testimony from several witnesses that Stephen was fascinated by gadgetry and could easily have used the pipes to construct a lethal bomb. A check on Stephen Benson's security company had shown that it was losing money heavily, most of it borrowed from Margaret Benson with extra embezzled through a secret company. Benson's defense team, led by the flamboyant local attorney, Michael McDonnell, battled hard to destroy this possible motive for the killings. They said he killed his mother because he stole two and a half million dollars from her. But you won't hear that in this courtroom because it wasn't true. The court heard McDonnell concentrate on trying to blacken Scott Benson's reputation and cast him either as the target for a murder attempt or even the murderer who had died in a bungled explosion. It emerged that Scott was not Stephen Benson's brother, but his nephew. The illegitimate son of Carol Lynn, who had been adopted at birth by her parents. But all this was a distraction from the fact that there was not a shred of hard evidence against Scott. In contrast, the forensic case against Stephen Benson was watertight. Prosecutor Jerry Brock drove this home during his final speech. Mr. McDonald said he wasn't able to determine who had committed this particular crime. Mr. McDonald's problem is that he was looking everywhere else, everywhere else, except right here at the table in front of him. On the 7th of August, 1986, the jury found Stephen Benson guilty on all charges. Half of them recommended the death penalty. But Judge Hugh Hayes imposed two life sentences. Although there were still some members of the public who seemed to believe that Benson was not guilty, 
the public prosecutor was delighted that the family's money had not been able to gain an acquittal in the face of such overwhelming forensic proof. The system has worked properly and it has demonstrated that the amount of money that a defendant has doesn't buy his freedom. The final irony was that Stephen Benson did not have that money for long. For there is a statute in Florida called the Slayers Act. This states that convicted murderers cannot inherit money from their victims. So Stephen Benson failed to get any benefit from a murder which he had obviously been convinced would never be tracked back to him. Butch DeFeo too could not fight against the forensic and other evidence which he had left behind. During a year in custody, DeFeo had retracted his confession. He now blamed a variety of accomplices, including his sister Dawn. It had come as no surprise when his defense attorney asked for Butch's mental state to be assessed. Uh, to have the court appoint uh, physicians to examine the defendant for the purpose of uh, ascertaining whether or not he is presently fit to stand trial, whether or not he can assist uh, the psychiatrists inevitably differed, with some claiming that Butch was a deeply aggressive and antisocial personality, but in no way insane, while others reckoned that he had been in the grip of paranoid delusions and did not know what he was doing when he massacred his family. On this basis, his attorney began to consider the possibility of a plea of insanity. There is that possibility. We're certainly going to uh, uh, review an insanity defense in this case. And when the case came to court, that was the basis of the defense. DeFeo did his best to act the part. Under cross-examination, he claimed that he had killed his family in self-defense and then changed his story, saying that his sister Dawn had forced him to do it. But these attempts to convince the jury that he was insane carried little weight. He too was found guilty on the 21st of November, 1975, and sentenced to 25 years imprisonment for each of the six murders. Despite speculation about DeFeo's motive, one common thread does emerge in these two cases, which may help to explain, but not excuse, why two men from privileged backgrounds behaved as they did. Both could be said to have had emotionally deprived backgrounds, and to have resented being dominated by their parents and thwarted from getting to the wealth which they felt should be theirs. Stephen Benson's mother used her control of the family finances to dominate her children's lives. Neither of her sons had the strength of character to break free, and Stephen Benson in particular seems to have been deeply upset by his failure to build an independent life. Butch DeFeo suffered from an overbearing father and a violent and abusive family background. He too had been unable to make any sort of independent life for himself. But the DeFeo story had one final twist, which sets it apart from the other family murders. For the house was sold at the end of 1985 to new owners, who moved in knowing of the murders which had taken place and having taken the precaution of getting a priest to bless the house. Some 28 days later, they fled in terror. Their story of constant unexplained noises, foul smells and inexplicable events which culminated in sighting demonic figures became the basis of the film the Amityville Horror. It was claimed that the house had been built over an Indian burial site. For some people, this raised the possibility that Butch DeFeo had been in the possession of evil spirits. However, the house still stands at Ocean Avenue. Occasional visitors still come to stare at it. But none of the recent owners have ever reported any feelings of evil, whether from Indian spirits or from the aftermath of the terrible killings carried out by Butch DeFeo.